My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. We've been hanging out with some heavy hitters lately with our shoot interviews, and today is no exception. The great Klaus Jansen is in the house. Jimmy, rattle off a bibliography and let's get started. Well, if I did the whole bibliography, that would be the full hour, Ed. Uh, we know him from his collaborations with Frank Miller on Daredevil and then in the 80s on Dark Knight Returns. Uh, he wrote the DC Guide to Penciling and Inking. He's been teaching comics at the School of Visual Arts, as well as teaching editorial uh, retreats to up-and-coming Marvel uh, cartoonists. But he has a 50-year career in comics, working for Marvel and DC. He's worked with virtually everybody, uh, top writers, as well as top pencilers. And he is a penciler, inker, colorist, writer, creator. In every regard, this is a consummate comics comic book professional. I, I could go on, but uh, I would much rather have Klaus tell us about his, his uh, comics making than to have me rattling off this list. Klaus, thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. It's great to be here, I have to tell you. Thanks. All right, here's the opener, man. We'll start off soft and just get conversational. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical really quickly. Sure. Uh, as, as professional anchor, consummate professional, uh, let's say you get a tightly penciled page from a, a young upstart cartoonist, penciler, we'll call them in, very tight artwork. And it's a pretty tough shot that the guy is drawing in pencil. It's a back view of Captain America swinging a shield up, both arms back. You see Captain America from behind. And when this, when this page <laughs> comes down the pike onto your drafting board, you notice that the guy drew two right hands. <laughs> As an inker, what do you do? Uh, well, I fix it then. You know, if, it, if it's, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Of course, yeah. I fix it. Why? What? This is a trick question, right? It's not really a trick. I was just looking at an <laughs> old. Uh, <laughs> I was just looking at an old uh, Heroes Reborn joint. And, uh, well, I think you've started off the interview very well, Ed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of stuff out there. We we see uh, we, we see the anchors hanging out the pencilers to dry, man. Yeah, totally. I agree. Uh, you know, the, if if somebody is drawing two right hands, I mean, you fix it. Um, you know, I mean, I think that's part of the job. See, that's an inker talking, man, not a tracer. Here's another uh, opening salvo to get us started. <laughs> another <laughs> one? Go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 this is cool. Uh, do you know this book? Uh, yes, I do. Actually, I do, yeah. So in the pages of this book is ah, yes. some early uh, fandom work from the great Klaus Janssen. Uh, can you tell us about this right here? Maybe potential dates, how old you were when you drew this, print run of the zine, that kind of thing? That, you know, I, I came up um, in an era when everybody was doing fanzines and, and basically uh, they weren't even Xeroxes. They were uh, mimeographed uh, or, you know, using carbon paper and tracing stuff off and... Uh, a friend of mine and I, David David Kasikov, uh, and we're still friends to this day. Um, he lived out in Port Washington. I lived in Connecticut, and we got together somehow. We got together through um, exchanging uh, mail uh, on uh, on in some fanzine, and we connected with comics, and we decided we should do a. Um, a fanzine of our own. And we started a, a fanzine called The Creative Adventure. And that was during that time when, you know, people like Paul Levitz uh, were doing The Comic Reader. Um, so there were a lot of fanzines uh, out there, a lot of amateur stuff. And this was like a four page story that I, that I wrote and drew. I, I mean, I don't know if you can even say wrote and drew, you know what I mean? Uh, but I was about, I would guess 18 or 19 at that time. Those were pages that I showed, um, part of what I showed Gil Kane uh, at my first Phil Suling con. Um, I grabbed him as he was coming out of a ballroom, out of a, uh, a panel that he was on. And I just you know, threw pages at him and uh, asked for a crit, a critique. Yeah, it's interesting seeing such early, early work that like lines up so nicely with like some of your signature work, like Daredevil, it's got sort of like a grit, a street view, 
like uh, and ordinary people, you know, kind of. There's there's methods and materials uh, on display too with Zipatone, some ink spatter, probably had to use Frisket for the spatter on that building right there to mask yeah. the other panels. Yeah, very, very much so. Yeah, it, it and Tom, you're right. And Ed, you know, it's 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 uh, I was thinking in, in preparation for for today, you know, what how can you see uh, my progress as an artist? And you can see right away, you know, my, my interests were texture and, and uh, gray tones and uh, uh, something a little bit more lively than, uh, say, a, uh, a very tight approach to, to the art. What led, led you to that, Klaus? We, you know, like we grow up a generation later and we have books I hate to say how to draw comics the Marvel way, but you know there are there are books on how to make these comics. Um, now with the internet, people can see demos of all these different materials. You know, we talk about screen tone and all this stuff. How were you learning this in the seventies? That's a that's a really interesting question. Um, I think you know I was I was learning it through uh, really osmosis. Um, you know, looking at stuff and. Uh, trying to emulate uh, the work that I admired, and and you know part of it is uh, desperation also. Um, you know the need to uh, find a way to make a living or to be creative under uh, circumstances that really don't encourage that. You know we were uh, I was an immigrant, a first generation immigrant. We were really poor. Uh, in terms of, you know, being able to have a lot of options. I wasn't able to go to college because we didn't have the money to do it. Uh, so some of that was desperation, but a lot of it was, you know, I was a, a, a kind of a, 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 an, an introvert, a nerdy kid. And uh, comics were, from the very beginning when I got here, comics were... Um, I learned how to read and write through comics. Uh, my first experience with the English language was through comics. Um, and then at a certain point, you know, I, taking a big jump, at a certain point, I, I went up to DC. Um, they had, I think I was 17, maybe it was 16, 17. I had read in a comic book um, that they offered free tours on Friday afternoons. I don't know, do you want to hear this story? I don't know. Oh, if you, yes. yeah, yeah. And uh, I should, so I got, I got uh, uh, duded up and you know, I wore a jacket and I put on a shirt and stuff and uh, uh, went to New York via, via Metro North. And I, not, I, I got up to the uh, floor where DC was located, where the offices were located and the, the receptionist um, was very nice. I said to her, I'm here for, you know, the Friday afternoon tour. And she said, well, uh, we don't do those tours anymore. And I, I was just so, you know, flabbergasted and so uh, stymied that I think I, I, you know, she could see tears welling, <laughs> welling up in my eyes. And I said to her, and I remember this because it was such a funny thing to say. I said to her, you know, she said, we don't do tours anymore. And I said, but, but I'm wearing a tie, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, that would, you know, so she took, she took pity on me and she, she said, let me see what I can do. And she went into the office and she dragged out Jack Miller. Do you, do you know that name? He was the editor of Dead Man at the time and a bunch of books, maybe Brave and the Bold and stuff like that. So Jack apparently had nothing to do. And he took me around. He took me around the office. He took me around and I met uh, Carmine Infantino uh, who drilled me, uh, interrogated me about, you know, what kind of covers I like. And I met Neil Adams who was working on a Strange Adventures cover. Uh, I met uh, Marv Wolfman and Len Wein who were hanging out in the cafeteria, which was basically a closet with a table, you know, a plastic table. And, and most importantly, I met Dick Giordano. And he became, as it turns out, he, he knew who I was because of all the letters that I had sent him at Charlton. And uh, 
he coincidentally lived in the town next to me in Connecticut. I lived in Bridgeport, he lived in Stratford. And uh, I had pages with me and he said, uh, you know, if you wanna come over to my house and uh, uh, talk, talk shop, uh, do. And uh, of course I took him up on that invitation. And, and so to get back to your, you know, your question, Jim, um, after the period of osmosis and struggling and trying to figure out uh, how to draw or how to ink or how to do this as a, as a career, um, meeting Dick was really pivotal. Um, you know, he taught me a lot. Did you, did you have like an, like what was your art education like prior to this? What, were you just figuring it out? Um, did you, do you have like a bunch of like watercolors or something you did in school? Or did you have a parent or a sibling who, who did art like, or was it? I, I, I always drew, um, you know, when I, uh, when I started reading comics, um, what I would do, and I remember this very clearly sitting at the kitchen table, uh, you know, my mom making dinner um, but I would be sitting at the kitchen table cutting apart um, the, the books uh, that I was reading, which were Superman and Batman at that time, you know, it was the late 50s and early 60s. Um, and then I would reconfigure the figures and make my own comics, take them up. So, you know, Lois Lane would be kissing, you know, Superman or something, you know. Uh, that's, you know, my version of, uh, of uh, a story. And I realized, you know, I'm cutting apart all these comics and, and of course I'm destroying them. So um, I thought I should really start drawing um, instead of cutting apart these comics. So, you know, it was, a, it was sort of like a, a, a pragmatic, practical thing for me to do. And um, yeah, that's how I started. But I never, Tom, I never had any kind of art education. Um, I never uh, went to school or anything. Um, you know, I think that, you know, to jump around a little bit, please interrupt me, but uh, the, the, the two pivots in my career where I learned the most was uh, working with Frank on Daredevil and teaching at SVA. Um, I, I realized after my first class at SVA, which was a long time ago at this point already, it was 30 years ago, but I realized after my first class, I didn't know it. I didn't know a damn thing. And, and, and worse, I couldn't verbalize what I did know. So I really had to go back and, and uh, sort of retrench and start to learn what storytelling was really about and what drawing was about, but more importantly, what storytelling was about and the responsibilities of communicating information to the audience and what went into that. Um, and that made me really a, a, a better artist, knowing that or, or coming up with uh, uh, philosophies and theories about storytelling. And it's kind of interesting in the sense that a lot of us, and I've, I've spoken to a lot of my peers about this, um, but more or less and mostly more, we all kind of get to the same point, whether you've had um, education, you know, college or art school or, uh, you know, mentorship with Dick Giordano. It, it all kind of comes down to the same basic uh, elements and theories of storytelling. It's just fascinating. Yeah. It's real smart to uh, be in a position where you have to verbalize the the craft because i do feel like uh most people once you get involved in the game there's a sort of inertia that takes place and you're almost operating through intuition rather than you know a personal rule set or something talking about know. it forces you to uh to think about it too because the other thing that can happen when especially comics are so isolated you can develop bad habits if you're left to your own devices you know you can get into that I hate to say rut, but you can get into a pattern where you aren't pushing. That's something, um, Klaus, as I listened to interviews with you this week, preparing to talk to you, sure. I was really impressed with your level of curiosity. You know, it seemed like, um, and I don't know if this comes from when you started teaching and realized you needed to, to maybe figure out how to describe some of these ideas, but I was impressed by that natural curiosity that you seem to have, like a real energy towards wanting to get better, wanting to learn, 
um, you know, wanting to bring new elements into the comics that you make. We talk to a lot of cartoonists. Not everybody is like that. It, it's something that I admired a great deal. And uh, I wonder if that's something, it sounds like it's something you've had your whole life. That's, a, that's an interesting point, Jim. I appreciate you saying that. I really do. I, I think I'm, I'm very competitive. Um, I feel, I feel, um, you know, at this point, um, I, I, I feel competitive with time, you know, because I feel like uh, the, I, I can feel the breath of mortality, you know, on my neck. And uh, so I'm, I, 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 I spend a lot of time trying to uh, overcome that and, and, and be as, a good an, as good an artist as I possibly can. I spent the pandemic last year, the summer, um, learning how to uh, use the Cintiq and how to uh, work digitally. And I spent uh, this past summer uh, learning how to color digitally. I, I, I want to get back into coloring my own work. And, you know, I don't need to do that. I don't need to learn how to color digitally. Um, there are plenty of great colorists out there. Um, but I want to get better at my craft and what I do. And I think even learning how to color digitally, for instance, learning how to color digitally has already affected the way I draw and the way I lay out a page. Everything is connected, you know, it's all part of a larger process and a larger goal. Um, so I'm always interested, yeah, in, 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 in maintaining a level of uh, creativity, um, you know, integrity. Um, I wanna push things forward. Um, so I've, I've, you're right, I've always been, I think that way, uh, always been, yeah interested in being um better piggybacking off that question uh your your ink work uh your line is very different than uh, a lot of what was in comics uh when when you first sort of unveiled that that energy uh who are some of the artists you were looking at outside of comics that might have contributed to to these these ideas any other pen and ink artists out there or painters or you know, I was really influenced a lot by, um, of course, the people that came before me, but uh, outside of comics, um, there was a certain time when I discovered uh, Chinese calligraphic uh, inking, and, and they used a very, very uh, fat, juicy, expressive line. Uh, oftentimes, it, 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 it uh, went into dry brush because uh, it was just so uh, emotional and so expressive. And I think that really influenced me a lot. And, and I think secondly, the thing that influenced me was uh, the, the technical aspects of reproduction that back in the 70s or in the 80s, when, when I really uh, started uh, to work and see the work published, um, the printing was so archaic and so, you know, inaccurate really, that the figures required a certain amount of weight in order for it to be seen or to, in order for it to have impact. Um, we don't need that anymore, um, which is why I think a lot of the digital work is, has a very thin line because the reproduction is that much better and, uh, coloring is that much better and can separate shapes, but um, I, I definitely think that the technology um, at that time uh, influenced me a great deal. Uh, my editors used to tell me that my original pages look like shit, but when they reduced and were, were reduced and shot down, they, they hung together. And I'm not sure at that time that I understood what they were saying, but you know, if they were happy and the pages hung together and they thought so, then, then I'm, I'm good with that. But you know, if I might say, by the way, I think that most of the advances or most of the steps forward in terms of uh, comic books have always been um, precipitated by the technology. 
that that it's the it's better printing or it's better coloring or it's better reproduction that births the uh, uh, a different way of working. Uh, I find that really interesting, and a lot of people, uh, you know, eliminate that from the equation. Uh, but I think it's really important. I'm so glad we went down this this route because uh, your your early work when you had way more control uh, where you're you're drawing and coloring right uh, you made excellent use probably some of the best uses of surprint uh, color holds than I've ever seen in in comics at that time I'm thinking about uh, pushing backgrounds to the back by just mm -hmm. having like a pure cyan skyline uh, stuff like this using uh, you know, dot patterns, zip, zip a tone screens uh, of a different color to just kind of like create a muted palette or something. Uh, was this something you saw in comics beforehand? I mean, I guess Neil Adams did do some of that stuff. I think of that Havoc cover and right. X-Men and stuff. Uh, but um, where did this come from? Were, were you experimenting on the page and checking the results in print and, and moving forward? How does that process work? You're right, uh, Ed, that uh, Neil was uh, a, an influence of mine, you know, in, in many different ways. And, uh, and also Tom Palmer. Uh, Tom also used a lot of surprints and he did his own coloring. Uh, so that was a big um, uh, kind of a, when I saw Tom doing that, I thought, OK, you know, I should take a crack at this, at, at coloring my own stuff. Um, and part of it was, you know, just to talk about the coloring for a second. Um, when I was doing Daredevil, I, I was often frustrated at uh, some of the choices that the colorists would make. In other words, they would, you know, I'd put up split lighting or some kind of a special effect or, or using a surprint or a zip -a tone or, and, and they wouldn't really know what to do with it. Um, and it, oftentimes their choices would contradict my intention. So uh, that became frustrating for me. Um, and I, I thought, you know, I should really try doing this myself and kind of seeing the vision that I have in my head all the way through rather than giving it over to, to someone else. Um, but I think, Ed, you know, one of the most important things that, that uh, well, I mentioned two things. One is, the, the medium that we work in has certain limitations. And, you know, obviously one of them is we don't have sound, we don't have music. Um, and another one is we, we, it's flat. We don't have depth. We literally do not have depth. Uh, we, have, we could play with height a little bit. Uh, and Frank did that a lot with his vertical panels, right? Um, we could do a uh, widescreen, so we, we can play with width a little bit, but we have no depth. So it became really important to me to overcome that limitation by using color or surprints and creating distance, making sure that we have, you know, a foreground, a middle ground and a background and, and creating the illusion of depth, which I find really a magic act you know it's 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 truly uh, magical in that sense and there are a lot of things in this medium that are magical um and i think the the ability to create depth and the the illusion of depth is a real uh challenge and a real opportunity and and necessary um and then the other the other so that was one of my concerns and then the other concern that i that i still have well i still have both of them but the other concern that that I was uh provoked a lot of um my coloring choices and inking choices was that i think that um you know we as artists are also entertainers and so our job is to story tell but also to be entertaining while we do it and uh you know, I don't necessarily believe in the, uh, you know, the Alex Toth approach, which is just focusing purely on storytelling and simplicity. Um, I believe in that, but I would lay, you know, overlay on top of that, the 
I have a desire to give the reader something to look at. And whether or not that's, that's you know, uh, a special effect using serpents or some color effect or, you know, doing a lot of zip a or or detail, um, I think that's valid. And, and I, I kind of like to strike a middle ground, um, you know, between pure storytelling and, and, you know, the simplicity of an Alex Toth page with uh, some, uh, you know, Tom Palmer kind of uh, detail or effects or coloring. Um, yeah, yeah. I have one more uh, question uh, yeah. going down, down this path. Um, being an artist who is able to uh, to color their their work in that very rigorous system, uh, can you tell us a little bit about you, how how you would schedule things when you were working like that? Uh, do you have to bang these inks out really fast to buy a week to color? Are you uh, inking a page and working on the color guides at the same time? Yeah, uh, uh, certainly. Ed. The it it was always a question of things overlapping. And still is, um, and and I don't mind that at all because I find that uh, having two or three different things on my drawing board um, uh, keeps me engaged. So I can spend a couple of hours penciling. I could spend two hours, you know, coloring. I can spend an hour inking something, and I find that keeps me uh, fresh, and I'm able to actually put in a longer day. So it's, it was, it's always a question of um, not only the demands of you know, the, the industry or Marvel or, and DC, but also um, knowing myself and knowing how to get the most work out of, out of myself. Klaus, you mentioned that there were like two big uh, pivot moments in your career. And one of them was working with Frank Miller on Daredevil what what else did you what did you learn in that you know working with him on that book you know um i started to pick up some fundamental concepts of uh storytelling and uh eye flow on the page you know how to read a page um i don't think it's uh debatable that frank is really good at that and uh, I learned a lot from that, from, from, from uh, uh, having more, more responsibility on, the, on Daredevil than I started out with. Uh, and Frank was very, um, he was very generous in terms of allowing me more input. Um, so I had a larger footprint on Daredevil as, as, it, as it went uh, along in the, in the three years, I think, that we were working on Daredevil. Um, but yeah, definitely eye flow and uh, uh, composition um, choices. Uh, choices are important. Um, and I'll tell you that uh, when Frank and I, we, uh, we just had dinner last week and uh, we still talk about exactly this kind of stuff. Um, we were talking about um, my favorite uh, page from Dark Knight. And uh, which was the, uh, do you guys want to hear this? Yeah, yes. we want to hear it all. <laughs> uh, my favorite page from Dark Knight was the, the page where the woman, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, the woman was on the subway and she was going home and she had like, like a bomb in her purse or something. And she was going home to, to bring a present to her kids. I mean, that, that page freaks me out because that was one page and, and, and I was telling Frank this, that, that just one page where he basically created an entire story uh, behind this, this woman on the subway. It had a beginning, a middle, and an end. I mean, you could have done an entire 21 pages of just this person, you know? And, and it's so impressive in terms of uh, being able to do that in the middle of, you know, dark night. It's just amazing. And uh, so that the, the ability to be so precise and so concise uh, is something that I really learned uh, a lot uh, from Frank. It's, um, 
You know, in my class at SVA, I try to emphasize that um, all of your decisions have meaning. That once you're in the enclosed space of a page, whether the borders are, you know, the 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 borders of the of the page, the physical page, or the borders that you determine by drawing a line around it. Once you're in that space, everything within that space is related and everything is connected and everything is in a relationship. So if you move one thing around, it affects everything else. And that's a fundamental, I think, concept that a lot of students don't realize until they get to you know, actually learn about the medium. Um, but that was something that I think I became much more aware of when I was working with Frank, that the, the relationship and the connection of your choices and that choices and your, your choices and your decisions have, have a lot of fucking meaning. You know, it's, it's everything. When uh, there was that issue of Daredevil that I guess got rejected by the code or, or Marvel just wasn't oh, able yeah. to uh, put, it, put it out and they, they were maybe going to go into reprints for, for that month, but you and Frank got together and said, no, nah, we, we, we got this, man. We'll, we'll put together a comic in two weeks. Uh, can you expand on that you know, moment of time? How, what was the division of labor there? How did that work? Were you and Frank in the same room? Uh, no, we weren't in the same room, but we lived uh, about three or four blocks from each other uh, at that time. This was before he went to uh, California. He, uh, he lived on 13th Street in, 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 the, in the West Village, and I lived on Perry Street, which is you know, literally three or four blocks. He lived in a, in a very French garret. You know, it had like uh, um, a big uh, window. Um, sort of, it was just a very Frenchy, arty kind of a place. Uh, I liked it a lot. Um, and, I, and, and occasionally Frank, Frank would come over to my place and we would, you know, talk shop or try different things, which was, it's, it's a very good memory, you know, to be able to uh, uh, say that. But um, what was your question, Ed? <laughs> Uh, you know, that's, sorry, that's, yeah. that's a very short window uh, to, to make a complete issue. Oh, of, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is actually a, a really one of my favorite moments uh, on, on the Daredevil run. They, you know, the Comics Code had, as you know, pulled uh, re or rejected this particular issue, which was the, the Punisher issue. It had some, you know, the kids were taking drugs and, you know, of course, jumping out out of the window and uh so the uh the comics code uh uh you know uh said we we can't do this so jim shooter had called us uh, we were both up in the office either coincidentally or on purpose i forget but shooter called us into the office and said you know listen i have bad news the 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 uh, comics code rejected this issue and we're gonna have to go for a reprint and I, I, I just remember it as clear as it was yesterday. Frank and I looked at each other, you know, in the office. And Frank said, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're we're going to do a new issue. And, and I thought, great, this is fantastic. This is exactly what we should be doing. You know, screw the comics code. They're going to make us do a reprint. We're not, we're not doing that. So we came up with this, or well, Frank came up with this uh, story. Um, you know, it wasn't the best uh, story in the in the in the Daredevil run, but I was really happy that we didn't have to go to a reprint, and uh, we did. We cranked that issue out uh, in about two weeks to make the deadline. Yeah, it was amazing. It was just a lot of fun. Your um, style, like, implies. Um, like a certain like speed or energy or like a Jackson Pollock almost kind of energy in the making of it. And I wonder how much of that is like the actual reality of making it. Like, are, are you maybe doing this stuff a lot more slowly and meticulously that then it seems to imply like, like do your hands move fast when you're working or do they, or, or is slower, you know, what? It, it uh, you know, I think it's both Tom. I, I, I do see it in my head. 
um, and I do tend to ink fast. Yeah, both. Um, so if I don't get the effect by moving my hand fast or by pressing down on the brush or on the nib, um, I will I will rework the line until I get what I see in my head, which is you're right. It's about energy. It's about um, movement. It's about creating the illusion of movement. It's about uh, excitement, you know, uh, all, all of those things. Um, I don't want, I mean, does anybody want to read a boring comic, right? I mean, you know, uh, and I think that those elements are somewhat, you know, the antithesis of boring, you know, it's, it's interesting and it's tough to create, you know, movement in a comic or movement on a page. Um, there are a couple of ways of doing it, I think, but, I always try to, you know, and you're exactly right. I always try to imprint a little bit of uh, excitement. You know, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm thinking uh, that, you know, one of the ways to create excitement or, or the opposite of boring is through contrast. And whether it's big panels against little panels or black against white or, you know, or red against blue or whatever it is, um, part of it is thin line against a thick line. And, you know, what that signifies to the read, how, how does that read in the reader's brain? You know, what does that create? And I've always been fascinated by, by that too. So um, the ability to create excitement or a little bit of visual tension, um, all of that is doable through various means. And certainly one of them is contrast and thin line, thick line. Klaus, we keep talking about Frank Miller and, you know, one of his... Uh... One thing that, that I would find with him, you know, he was one of my favorites when I started reading comics, is he, he seemed to be early on manga as an influence. And part of that is storytelling, but I also think of manga as being, you know, these gray scales and screen tones and, you know, quite honestly, certain qualities that I see in some of your work and some of what you've described here this morning. Uh, were you, did, did he expose you to that? Do you look at manga? Was that something that you found an influence in? Um, you know, honestly, I'm not a uh, not as knowledgeable, um, you know, about manga as I should be. I could probably not name more than one or two uh, um, artists that that work in manga. Uh, I do have books in my library that I look at, um, but I was aware that that Frank was uh, looking at it, especially when Ronan came out. Um, and even even before that, some of the some of the stuff that he penciled and inked on Electra, some of the black and white stuff was very manga influenced. Um, I'm still trying to incorporate more of that kind of work into my own work, um, but unfortunately, not probably not enough. You know, I I, I think that there's more there for me to um, steal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also curious about, uh, you know, jumping ahead a few years to Dark Knight, yeah. your reaction to Lynn Varley's coloring, you know, um, that stuff still looks pretty revolutionary here decades later. You know, you're a, you're a colorist in addition to your line work. What was your reaction when you started to see those pages by Lynn Varley? Is that something, did you talk to her about them? Was that a big conversation? Um, you know, th there, was a, there was a time when I don't know if you know this, that, that Frank was part of the Upstart studio um, with uh, Walt Simonson and Howard Chaikin. And, uh, and then there was a rotating fourth member that would, okay, you know, it, it would uh, vary. Sometimes Bill Sienkiewicz would be in. Um, and I remember sitting down on a, on a, on a sofa uh, talking to Lynn about uh, coloring just the, the basic concept of, uh, you know, how to color and what, what theories go into it. But that was the extent of it, you know? And when we got to Dark Knight, um, I think Frank uh, and Lynn were probably in California at that time. Yeah, they were. They were in California during the Dark Knight period. So we didn't have as much, you know, personal interaction. 
Um, but I appreciated what she was able to do. And, and, you know, as we were talking earlier, the, the technology and the printing process was so primitive that uh, anytime anybody was even reasonably successful, you know, at, at, at navigating, you know, the primitive nature of the reproduction, uh, I give them all the credit in the world. We would oftentimes at Marvel, um, they would try different ways of reproducing, you know, full color. Archie Goodwin was always working on uh, stuff on the epic line. And uh, oftentimes the, the work would come in and it would just be the plates would be off register and, you know, people would be running around with, with their hair on fire. So it was, it was difficult, you know, it was, it, I mean, it was real um, complicated or complex to try and get that, like, uh, what was the book that Lynn colored, uh, Daredevil, uh, not Daredevil, uh, Electra, the, the full, full Lynn color Lynn. graphic novel yeah. that, that Frank and Lynn did? I just remember that coming in and, and having a lot of uh, technical problems to solve. Um, so yeah, I thought, I thought Lynn did, a, did an excellent job. I will say, by the way, I've always had uh, not to uh, disparage or you know, uh, say anything negative uh, about the coloring, uh, which I liked. I've just always had a hankering to recolor Dark Knight. Um, you know, just, just the way I see it, which is different, you know, not better, not worse, just different. Um, I don't think that'll ever happen, but, uh, I'm ready to start that petition. Yeah, let's I, know. Do that. I yeah, want to see that book. <laughs> Yo, Jim Lee, man. DC has, has recolored several books, you know, like we've talked about like, like killing joke being recolored. A lot That's of right. books get recolored in different editions. Man, a Klaus Jansen well, color even, job would it, be amazing. It would definitely there. be talked about. <laughs> That's well, true. It would get a lot of hype. Well, cause like you have, um, you have like Batman year one, which has those two very mm -hmm. different color approaches. That's, that's right. And, yeah. And so like, why not dark? Like I'd love to, I love the contrast of those two approaches on that. So yeah, dark night. Hey, you know, you heard it here first. <laughs> I, I, I would just, it's just, it's just a project that I'd like to do for fun. You sure, know, it, yeah. it has no ulterior meaning or anything like that. No. It's just uh, kind of fun. Um, so uh, yeah, who knows? Yeah. One of the crown jewels of my library is that artist edition, studio edition, gallery edition, whatever they call that, where they're reprinting all of the uh, original art. And there are several questions that I have like uh, revolving around that. Uh, certainly one of the things that I made note of that, that I wasn't quite aware of uh, with the initial comic was uh, like some of Frank's re-inking uh, of, seems largely issue three, three and four. Um, I wonder if that was a result of the color coming in, because it really seems, you know, there's your version of what you inked and uh, what what uh, Frank inked. And in a lot of ways, like the, the difference seems to be that you indicated light source and he just kind of kept things open. Um, is, is that about the crux of it or what was the deal? I think that, um, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but we had uh, Frank and I had a bit of a, a tiff um on the on the third issue and uh he um felt that i wasn't um hitting my mark let's say and uh decided or felt that he would uh redo you know a couple of panels or a couple of pages and uh, you know he had every every right to do that you know it was really his his project in 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 so many ways um, we've often talked about uh, this, you know, in, in re more recent times. Um, so it wasn't really about the coloring. I think it was, you know, <clears throat> Ed, you're right. I think I probably, uh, if I could use, you know, the, the, the phrase, I, I might have overworked some of the figures. I, I know that what comes to mind is that page where Superman is uh, holding up a tank. Uh, I think I did add a little bit of lighting and, and Frank uh, redid it in a much simpler, starker, uh, you know, uh, way without, without the lighting. And um, I think, you know, when we were working on Daredevil, I had a much uh, uh, more latitude to um, add stuff. 
or change stuff or you know uh, uh, contribute. And I think uh, Frank uh, felt that Dark Knight, uh, I, I might have uh, or should have pulled back a little bit. And that was you know, his right entirely. Um, when we got to the fourth one, I did, you know, was much more faithful to the pencils. I think he only found two panels that he redid, maybe, maybe three, but it was much, 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 much less than the third one. Um, yeah, I think that's 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 how that happened. Yeah. In that third issue, there were some revelations that 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 came out, uh, you know, several years back, where uh, you know we're the children of the speculator boom. So of course we were reading those Todd McFarlane and Rob Liefeld comics and things, uh, where Todd McFarlane wrote a piece on his website about uh, about inking some of the uh, some pieces in uh, Dark Knight Returns. He said that you you had a guy who was doing some background inking there. And Todd was just over the dude's house and was inking in some bricks and some, some rubble and things. It was, I guess, the pages where Superman's flying through uh, the, the subway after Bruce Wayne is dressed up like the hobo bag lady. And uh, one of the funny pieces was when you take a look at that gallery edition, everything that Todd said he inked <laughs> does have white out all over it. So it's not <laughs> like none of it is uh, in print. But uh, did you, were you aware, did you have any idea that, uh, that he, he touched those pages? No, none whatsoever. Uh, and, and, and let me say this, uh, you know, Todd's been riding that horse for the last 40 years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for somebody who's become as successful as he is, I really don't know why he needs this little nugget. But let me, let me you know, let me say this. Um, First of all, the assistant that I had, as all of my assistants uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, and, and I currently don't have an assistant. I haven't had an assistant in, in a long time. But anyone who is my assistant, all they do is fill in blacks and erase the pages. They don't do any line work. So if anyone is doing any line work, it is against my wishes and and this, uh, I forgot his name. Uh, yeah, but uh, it'll come to me. But so, uh, so this guy who I was using uh, as an assistant to fill in blacks and erase pages, um, apparently Todd was over his apartment. And, you know, I know the story only from reading about it as much as you guys do. Um, and, and this, and my assistant at the time said, you know, do you want to work on or ink some Dark Knight pages, which was the wrong thing for him to do. May I say that, you know, he had no right. You understand what I'm saying? He had no right to, 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 to do that. He had no right to uh, assume that responsibility. And that's always really, really pissed me off. Um, but, you know, it's done and it's, uh, it's out there. And, um, you know, Todd, Todd is, uh, you know, writing that beast until the day he dies, I think. <laughs> Those guys, uh, you know, this, this is just my, my theory. I, they know that they hit at a time where the buying temperature is high and the speculator boom was the thing. Like, that's how they achieved monetary success. But I do think they're chasing respect in a very small way at the very least, man. I think Jim Lee wants his Dark Knight Returns. I think Todd McFarlane wouldn't sneeze at having you know, his, his own kind of Dark Knight Returns legacy piece rather than just, you know, striking when the adults were investing in comics for like, like it was stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. I Listen, I get it, Ed. I get, I get the whole, uh, you know, uh, idea about, you know, wanting to be attached to a project like Dark Knight Returns. You know, if I were in Todd's shoes, I'd probably be doing the same thing. You know, it's a it's a it's a nerd dream come true, right? I I inked a panel or I inked some bricks or whatever it was. You know, wait, um, wait till you see the credit that I take for uh, the recolored Klaus Jansen edition. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm the mastermind behind that that version uh, once it comes out. As far as I, I look forward to it, Jim. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, Klaus, you worked at Marvel and DC in the 80s, and I wonder if there are any interesting stories there, if you could compare, you know, what that was like working for uh, those two publishers, one, one compared to the other, and did any of it stem from relationships with Jim Shooter? Did you leave Marvel because of, you know, conditions there? Um, what can you tell us about those two companies in the 80s? Um, first of all, I, I always got uh, along really well with Jim. Uh, I never had any problem with him. Um, so I, I, I am, I do know, um, uh, you know, that, uh, that was a rarity, I guess, um, that a lot of people, including editorial felt, uh, really, um, frustrated, you know, with Jim. And, uh, I think that, you know, well, what I was, yeah, what I was going to say is that, if, uh, first of all, um, Marvel and DC both were a lot more fun than they are now. I think that it, it's the nature of um, business or corporations, uh, you know, both Marvel and DC were not owned by corporate, uh, you know, uh, 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 entities. And uh, DC was a little bit more stodgy uh, as they always have had that reputation. Um, uh, than Marvel and but both of the companies were much looser than they are you know now and Marvel especially was a um, it was like a frat house um, uh, it was um, people would sleep over at night you know uh, to work or or uh, spend weekends there or, or, I mean, it was just fun. It was loose. It was, uh, you never knew who you were going to run into. Uh, you could always come up. Uh, you didn't need, you know, to go through security, you know, the post 9-11 era. Um, people weren't afraid of, you know, uh, visitors falling down and suing the company, you know, which is always now so prevalent. Uh, it's always about, um, you know, protecting your 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 space and protecting your business. I, I'll tell you that the uh, you guys probably know the name uh, Mark Grunewald, right? Uh, who who would have become editor in chief uh, uh, at at a certain point. Um, he he was a, a you know to give you an example of how loose it was. Um, he had an office, you know, there was a row of offices and, and then the bullpen was in the middle and the row of offices uh, were, were around the perimeter of the bullpen. And it was an actual bullpen. You know, there were artists working there. There were people, you know, doing paste ups and doing lettering and getting books out and, uh, you know, coloring. Marie Severin was there, who was just incredible. Um, a lot of, you know, Frank Giacoya, Mike Esposito, those inkers were there. Um, so uh, Mark had an office uh, on one side of the bullpen. And at one point, he built a hutch in his office, a, a kind of a platform. So to put the sofa on. So there were like, you know, bean bags and, and just mattresses, not mattresses, but, you know, foam cushions and stuff. And as it turned out, the, uh, the platform was hollow. And so uh, when Jim should... <laughs> When Jim would come down the hallway, Mark would hide underneath, he would hide in the hutch so that he wouldn't have to deal with Jim. And, and Jim never, you know, caught on to, to the fact that there was a, a hollow, you know, that it was hollow underneath the sofa. A panic so, room. You know, there, there, was, <laughs> there was just a sense of, of fun. And I can remember Archie Goodwin, um, who was on the other side of, of the, uh, the bullpen opposite Mark. And uh, Archie, Archie was, as I'm sure you've heard many times, Archie was just like, uh, if he wasn't the most beloved personality in comics, uh, certainly he was in the top three. The top, the, the, the other two being John Romita Sr. and, and uh, Dick Giordano. Um, so those three were like the, you know, the holy trinity. They were just amazingly brilliant people wonderful to share time with um you really get i always had the sense that i'm so lucky to be talking to this person you know they're they're just they're 
you know, their aura was just amazing. But Archie, <clears throat> what, during one of the times when Marvel was being sold and resold, you know, there was that period, I think, in the 90s or, or, or in the early 90s. And uh, the, new, the new owners cracked down on people showing up late. So, you know, they demanded that everybody punch in at nine o'clock or 9.30, whatever it was. And, and there were a couple of editors who showed up, you know, who lived in New Jersey, no names, please. But, uh, you know, they'd show up like at 11 o'clock, you know, or 12 o'clock. And th but they, then they'd work until six or seven or eight, you know. And Archie, Archie would show up like 10 or 11. Uh, you know, um, he, was, he was a devil may care kind of a guy. And so they were pressuring him to show up uh, at nine o'clock. So I was up at the office one day and uh, I looked across the, uh, the bullpen and there was Archie with a cup of coffee in his hand in his pajamas. And, and, and Archie said, look, they want me to come in at nine o'clock. This is what they're gonna get, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and by the way, uh, he won the argument. I love Archie Goodwin's yeah. stories. I, I like any of these stories of people that we've heard nothing but good things about. Uh, it's always great to get a firsthand story. That, that, that's a good one. I have not heard it before, so. Arch, awesome. Arch, Archie was, you know, Archie was a gift. Klaus, what was it like working with Alan Moore on, on that uh, Green Arrow two-parter, which you penciled, inked, and, and colored, if I remember? Yeah, that's a good question, because that's, that's just a couple of pages, so how how big was that script <laughs> it it was exactly uh what you would think uh, it was um, um it was long <laughs> <laughs> but you know uh, enjoyable how can you not uh enjoy uh, you know working with alan moore um so it was, it was uh, as verbose or perhaps not as verbose as the, as Watchmen, but on, on those, you know, uh, it's, it was comparable. He had a great sense of space and location. And uh, it was, you know, pretty easy to uh, uh, turn his words into uh, pictures. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a privilege. I I'll tell you that one time uh, I had dinner with, I guess this was maybe San Diego at, at a certain point, but I had dinner with, and I'm not sure why I was invited to this dinner, but I had dinner with Jeanette Kahn and Frank and, and Alan and, and me. And uh, uh, Alan and uh, Frank were, um, competing with story ideas. So Alan would throw, you know, it was like a card game. He would, you no, know, Superman turns into a gerbil, you know, <laughs> and, and, and Alan, and then Frank would go, you know, I'll, I'll see your gerbil and, 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 and raise you, you know, uh, a, a rhinoceros or whatever. And then finally, we, this went on for a little while and, and they were, you know, trying to outdo each other. And I forget who it was said, okay, Superman goes to hell. And then that was the winner. So we stopped, we had dinner. And I, I, I honestly forget who that was, but Alan is, a, you know, he's, a, he's a, you know, actually both of them, I think have such a reputation for being dark and dour and, uh, I found Alan to be, you know, in the few times that I've met him, to be just the opposite. And I can, I can tell you that uh, Frank is hilarious. I mean, Frank has such a dry sense of humor that uh, most of the time we're just, we're just giggling and laughing when we get together. Because of your long career, you've, you've kind of seen a lot of changes, I'm sure, in this industry. Do you have any memories of the early 90s, that, that image exodus, and then also, you know, comics kind of fall on a hard time there going into the mid 90s. Do you remember that time period? Anything stand out from that era? Well, I certainly remember everybody, you know, that the four or five uh, talents that left Marvel, you know, uh, Jim being uh, uh, among them, uh, Todd and uh, Rob, 
Um, Jim Valentino, I think, uh, was also in that group. Um, that was a pretty big deal. Um, probably, I think people didn't realize it was as big a deal as it became, because in some ways that was the beginning of, um, in some ways, uh, there have been other stabs at this also, but in some ways it was the beginning of creators taking more power um, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, accessing more power onto themselves, having more rights, you know, publishing rights and uh, 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 owning the IP, um, uh, money, of course. Um, uh, so that, that was a pretty big deal, but still, uh, I think in retrospect, probably a bigger deal than anybody even thought at that time. Um, so I do remember that very well. I think, you know, ever since I've been in the in comics, uh, there have always been uh, there's always been a doom and gloom uh, kind of an uh, assessment. Uh, certainly, when I got in, which was I guess the seventy four seventy five, but the seventies, eighties, and nineties were always about we have five years at the most, and uh, you know I always think about that David Bowie song. Uh, uh, where he talks about, you know, five years. I think it was from the, what album was that on? The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust. The what? Say it again. Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust. That's right, Ziggy Stardust album. Thank you, Tom. I knew you would do it. I, I knew <laughs> you would, yeah. And uh, so everybody always thought, oh, we have five years left. I never thought that. Um, I think maybe because I was naive and, and didn't really understand. Uh, but I never thought that, and I was kind of uh, a happy-go-lucky kind of a guy uh, in terms of, you know, I was happy to, to be working. I had great assignments. Uh, I worked with great people. Um, you know, what's to complain? <laughs> you, had, you, had, you had a couple of catbird seats during these these booms. Now, now that uh, we're on that that subject, I mean, Dark Knight. I'm sure I'm sure that still is uh, is is paying pretty well, man. But during that uh, that speculator boom the artist of batman spawn that, that had to be a heck of a payday and even getting those uh royalties on punisher warzone one like i'm sure that was a pretty good uh job to have you know it's funny is you say that at uh the uh, you, and you're right of course um that that uh dark knight continues to uh sell well um but one of the one of the projects that really surprised me in terms of uh, selling well that I never would have expected is Nightfall with uh, with Batman. Um, that thing just keeps on going, and I don't get it. <laughs> 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 but uh, you know, and then on the other hand, um, John Jr. and I did uh, Punisher Batman, and that didn't really do that well. Um, so, you know, there are always surprises there. It's difficult to predict, uh, you know, ask John about Punisher Batman. He'll, he'll grouse about it, you know, for a day and a half. You know what, man, I'm just, you brought back memories because that, that uh, during nightfall, my, my favorite issue, Klaus, you draw a hell of a two face, man. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. That's, I mean, you know, great character. What's the first thing that comes to mind uh, when John Romita Jr. Uh, is is brought up in, in terms of inking? I, you know, I, um, it's 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 a it's a tough thing to, um, you know, even somebody who's relatively verbal as I am to put into words about John's stuff. I think that uh, John is. John is well, number one. He's an amazing storyteller. Um, you know, he he hits all of the marks that uh, uh, storytellers are supposed to hit. I mean, one of the most uh, uh, easiest uh, compliments to give John is you never get lost in a John Romita uh, story. Uh, you always know where you are. You always know where you are in relation to the other characters, and you always know where you are in relation to the environment. He's just an amazingly clear, concise, and precise storyteller. 
Um, and for some reason, I think that, um, you know, my approach to inking, which, uh, you know, or at least part of it is that light line, heavy line contrast fits really well with, with John. And I, I just love working on his pencils. Um, it's, it's a kind of a natural organic fit. Um, and also part of, the pleasure of working with John is that he's so incredibly supportive of, of uh, what I do. And uh, you kind of need that, you know, it's good to hear positive feedback. Um, so it, it frees you up a bit, I think. Ed, does, does that answer your question a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. How's the, how's the transition from like physical media to digital going? You said you've, you've been, you know, moving over to that. Are, are you finding yourself like appro approaching things differently, thinking differently, like what, how's it changing things for you? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely, Tom, uh, the, the, uh, there is a period of adjustment and, um, you know, we were talking earlier about the, the crappy printing that, that comics uh, uh, used, uh, you know, prior to say 2000 or, or 1995. Um, and one of the things that happens with with the with the technology with with uh, digital uh, or you know working on the Cintiq or even better reproduction is you don't need that fat line anymore. The thin line uh, prints well, and um, it isn't necessary to highlight um, certain parts of the panel with a thicker line. Uh, you can do it other ways that are more delicate uh, because the printing uh, technology allows you to be a little bit more delicate. It's not as, not as brutal. Uh, you don't, I don't need to ink in, in, in a brutal way anymore, in an exaggerated uh, way anymore. Um, and it has, it's been, an, it's been a period of adjustment. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about it. I think a lot of people or a lot of artists from my generation are going through the same thing. You know, um, it's 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 an adjustment that requires a little bit of uh, thought, and uh, you know, I'm glad I'm feel competitive enough to try and uh, compete with you know the kids coming up today, which are amazing. You know, I look at someone like um, James Heron, um, who was uh, in my class at SVA. Um, you know, what he did with Rumble or what he did with uh, uh, Mega Man. Um, he's an amazing artist. Um, although I think he's traditional. You know, if I'm not mistaken, he's not digital. Um, he, he, yeah, yeah, he does original art on paper. Yeah, I mean, as like digital is becoming more ubiquitous, there is sort of this like pushback, you know, of, you know, sort of, you know, people who are like embracing, uh, you know, this like second wave of like embracing the actual like materials. It's a way to stand out yeah. because of the precise lines you could get digitally mm -hmm. to have that organic stroke just stands apart. Yeah, that's, it, and that's true. James, James always had the, uh, the saying, which uh, uh, I, I thought was wonderful is that the, the work really is born in the inking. Uh, it is birthed in the inking. And, uh, you know, he was good, um, you know, 15 years ago, and he's terrific now. Man, I have a million questions. <laughs> uh, I'll go this direction, Klaus. You, you oh. with uh, Bill Sienkiewicz on Daredevil, End of Days, and you guys, you kind of switched roles. You were a penciler and he was an inker. I've heard you talk about collaborating with pencilers and sort of, you know, having a conversation about what the goal is here. What do you, you know, how, how are you working together? How was the experience working with Bill Sienkiewicz? Did you have conversations with him about what, what you're both going for, what you're trying to do with that artwork? What was that like? Yeah, there was that, for some reason during that period of time, Bill and I would run into each other a lot, uh, I, you know, at different conventions. And um, even without um, having a project to do, uh, Bill and I, we get along really well. I think, I think we really, you know, we, we kind of love each other in, 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 in that way. Um, 
I certainly uh, admire his his abilities. He's just incredible. I mean, to say that he's, you know, one of the most gifted artists in the in in the business is I don't think hyperbole. Um, but yeah, we would talk about um, about the end of days, and I think the end of days was um, one of my best pencil jobs and one of the best ink jobs that 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 Bill ever did. He was he approached it rather. Um, uh, diligently in the sense that he uh, picked up on the pencils um, and executed the inking in a very faithful way. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, Bill has the ability to, uh, what I love about Bill's work is he won't, he won't go back. He, uh, he, if he makes a mistake, he will not correct it or he will just keep on going. He doubles down on it. And so at a certain point, you know, you look at end of days and the faces that were maybe, you know, over inked, uh, you know, just dense with line work, uh, that's where he doubled down, <laughs> you know, it was just, and I, I love that, you know, I love that. Whereas I would, I would stop and correct it or try to make amends somehow. Bill just keeps right on going. He's like a train. He, he just, he doesn't, you know, if it doesn't work, he's going to find a way to make it work if it kills him, but he's going down that track. And uh, I love that about him. Yeah. Interesting. You can watch some of his videos online of him drawing and you'll see exactly what you're describing. Uh, you know, for anybody watching this interview, that's curious where halfway through the drawing, you're like, that doesn't, how's he going to get out of that? He's like that. <laughs> he's like, guys, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, but we're just going to keep, let me put some bleach. Let me put yeah. some, like spray some word <laughs> let me dab it up. And then it, and then at the last moment it turns into something. It looks beautiful. The high wire act. Totally. I wanna I wanna ask you about another um artist that I'm that I'm a fan of, and I have no idea if this is somebody that crossed your path or not. But in the 80s, uh Jorge Zafino's work started to get published in the US and by Marvel. And he's one of the other guys I think of that really emphasized light source and you know textures. And I see some similarity to your work. Was that an artist that you were aware of or, or looked at or met? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I loved Jorge's work. Yeah. And I, he's still in my, uh, you know, uh, library, you know, in air quotes. There are a couple of people that I have um, right next to my drawing table. Um, he's one of them. Um, so he's always there. Um, Klaus, let's hear some of those other names that are right next to your drawing desk. Um, I have a lot of European stuff, um, Sampaio, um, uh, which was a big influence on, on Frank and, and me. Um, Alfonso Font, um, I think he's a Spanish artist, uh, F-O-N-T, he's terrific. Gil Kane, um, a big influence on me. Um, my favorite American artist, I think, is Gil. Um, yeah, so let me... Uh, can you tell us, tell us what you see in Gil Kane's work? I mean, he, he's a guy that's come up a lot on the channel and, and uh, I think a big influence, but I don't hear a lot of young cartoonists talk about him. Can you, can you talk about his virtues a little bit? Gil, um, what I really liked about um, Gil's uh, career is that he, he evolved. And, uh, you know, his work from uh, the early uh, DC period, the Westerns he did in the 50s, uh, the, the superhero stuff he did in the 60s, made such a jump when he got to uh, Marvel, uh, when he was doing Captain Marvel or all the covers that he was doing. Uh, Gil had the a combination of being able to incorporate the uh, dynamism of Jack Kirby with the elegance of uh, Hal Foster or Alex Raymond, you know, someone like that. So uh, Gil was able to combine those two um, characteristics as opposed to, you know, Kirby um, was not very delicate or not very elegant, let's say. And, and uh, Alex Raymond was not very dynamic. But Gill was able to, through his composition, uh, which was spot on, um, and his uh, ability to draw just the anatomy uh, that he could draw the figure in any position uh, doing anything, um, 
was just uh, and is just uh, I think very he hit he hit a he hit a mark he hit a level that most artists don't get to was uh, I Gil, think that's true was yeah. Gil Kane was he like a a personal friend the way the way Miller was was he like like a mentor or was it just like you know here's the pages I I know one of your earliest ink jobs was over Gil Kane right. Yes, yeah. Um, I think my second assignment, or maybe my third assignment, was uh, Black Panther um, by Gill. Um, I think the first one was Rich Buckler, and then the second one, or the third one, might have been Gil Kane. And then I did a whole bunch of uh, covers over Gill, and I inked also, and I'm babbling a little bit, so stop, but I, I inked um, his very last job. Uh, which was um, Adam and Green Lantern, I think. Yeah, uh, Green Lantern and Adam. Um, it was a two-parter, um, and I kept most of those pages. Uh, that was the job, you know, if I, if I can say, that was the job when I think I finally understood what he was doing and was able to ink him properly. Um, I had inked him prior in a couple of different jobs, including Daredevil, um, where I felt like I wasn't quite getting, uh, I wasn't on his level. Um, I don't know if I ever was on his level, even on the last job, but I got closer and I was happy with that last job. Um, I hope he was too. Um, but Gil had an amazing ability to uh, incorporate both um, the dynamism of like a Kirby and the elegance of someone like Alex Raymond. His composition is amazing. So at the beginning of the show, I mentioned that, you know, you've been teaching at SVA for decades. You teach at like the Marvel, whenever they bring in some, some young freelancers, you give those uh, seminars. You've done DC Guide to Penciling and the DC Guide to Inking. I, I highly recommend those to anybody watching who's interested in making comics. But I'm, curious, I, I'm curious from your standpoint, there's a lot that you can teach in storytelling. What are the things that you can't teach? What do we need to find out on our own? What do we need to bring, you know, as students that want to make comics? What do we need to come armed with? Ah, that's a good one. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things, and, and this may not be exactly the answer, you know, that you're looking for, Jim, but let me start with this, okay? Um, I think one of the things that, that uh, people in general don't realize is that success is often uh, precipitated by self-awareness. That you, you cannot, um, if, you, if you can't be honest with yourself, then you're ability to evolve and progress is going to be very limited. And however you achieve self-awareness, you know, whether it's um, psychoanalysis or therapy or religion, uh, although I think, you know, religion is basically oftentimes a, a dodge, but, um, I think that uh, students um, don't realize that um, being honest with themselves uh, is a critical um, part of not only their artistic development, but um, their development as human beings. Um, you know, there's a lot of delusional people walking around. Um, but I think in terms of uh, craft, you know, what you need, I think the most important thing is a methodology, a point of view, a, a theory about storytelling and art. And uh, you need to have a, 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 a idea of what it is that you want to accomplish or what your goals are. And as an example, because you know what I'm saying is a bit abstract, but clearly, you know, if you want to be a good storyteller, you're going to have to 
embrace clarity. Um, the page itself is a information delivery system. It's the thing that stands between you and the reader and your audience. You know, it's, it's the artist, it's the storyteller, the page, and that connects to the reader. If your information delivery system is confusing or chaotic, you failed. You have failed to communicate what it is that uh, you want to communicate. You know, you failed in communicating the story. So the, you know, you begin with clarity and you begin with acknowledging that that's the most important thing for the page to succeed. Um, and I believe that, uh, and, and pull me back, Jim, you know, uh, but I believe that the um, artist is completely and totally responsible for the page. It's not the writer. It's not the editor, it's not the colorist, it's not the letterer, it's no one else. It's the artist who is completely and totally responsible for the success or the failure of the page. And uh, unless you embrace that, you will never have the power to um, do a good page. You need to accept responsibility for the page. You know, I, I can't tell you how often I see uh, kids at, at, uh, at SVA or, or at a convention where they'll bring me a page or they'll bring me a sketchbook and they wanna crit. And then the first thing they say is, um, oh, I didn't get a chance to finish this panel because, you know, my dog died or, you know, or whatever it is, you know, giving me stories about their failings and reasons for their failings. I, I have very little to say to that. You know, my response is, look, you're responsible for this page. It isn't about your dog. It's about you and your page. And if your page sucks, it sucks because of you. You know, there's no, there's no other way around it. So I think, I think one of the things, you know, in addition to having the ability to draw and having the ability to storytell, which are paramount, it's the relationship that you have with yourself. You have to accept responsibility for this page and you have to accept whether or not it's a success or a failure is up to you. It's, it's your doing and no one else's. You kind of get what I'm trying to say, Jim? I love well, that. I, I often uh, make broad statements about cartoonists because at this point, my friends are cartoonists. That's who I talk to and everything. Sure, yeah. And then, yeah. and then I realize, like most of what I have to say, it's not just cartoonists, it's people. And I think that thing about accepting responsibility applies in the same way where, uh, you know, probably a lot of our shortcomings in life <laughs> boil down to, you know, you've got to accept responsibility for that. You know, part of my class at SVA, I don't, I don't, say this to the class because you know their heads explode uh, but it is about it's not only about the theory of a uh, comic book or sequential narrative storytelling it's a theory about life and 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 the two uh you know um join or intersect at a, at, at points and so you're right about that you know you're Listen, if you're miserable, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you had a lot of bad luck in your life or misfortune, uh, you can't really blame that on, on uh, exterior circumstances for too long. The great you know, John just, Waters has a, has a saying, man, you could blame your parents till you're 30. <laughs> I always think, uh, you know, it's a lot easier for, for you to change than for 7 billion people to change. So, yes. Um, that's, that's right. That's right. As far as like personal responsibility and stuff goes, like paint a picture for me, like tell me what it's like the first time like a a uh, Gene Colon page shows up and you have to ink it. Oh know? yeah, with all the, all the, the fine grays. Because it's stuff. like a fully rendered drawing and now it's your job to like communicate his intent to the rest of the world. Like what's that in, in, like? In black and white line. Yeah. Gene was tough to ink. 
Um, and I, and I, I you know, honestly, you know, I, like I'll say, the last job I did with Gil Kane, I felt like I was able to contribute and, and get the hang of it. I never got Gene. I never nailed it. Uh, Tom Palmer and I occasionally will, will speak of this uh, because I think that he was the ultimate Gene Colan uh, inker. Um, and Tom, Tom's just an amazing, you know, inker. His, his, his uh, uh, career, uh, you know, has been quite impressive also. But um, Gene was really tough for me. Um, I, I, I don't think... I don't think I even got close, actually. Uh, Tom had the ability, I think I inked a Gene without getting too much in the weeds. I, I inked him too angularly. Um, I put on too many angles. And my, my line was too straight and too rigid and, uh, and brittle. And Tom was able to um, ink Gene in a very fluid, uh, it, 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 it was like almost watercolor you know, when Tom and Gene, um, it, it just flowed on the page. And he had a really good feeling of what Gene uh, was trying to do. And uh, I never was able to quite ca capture that. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, listen, I, working, I cannot tell you how impressed I am um, and, and, and grateful for the uh, people that I worked with uh, or had the chance to work with. Uh, somebody, I was in Connecticut a couple of weeks ago at the, at the Terrificon and somebody brought up a weird War Tales cover that I inked over Ross Andrew. I don't remember inking Ross Andrew, you know, but it's amazing. And, and, and I think about, I inked Joe Kubert once on a cover I mean, who gets to ink Joe Kubert? Nobody, you know, that's, that's, that's an amazing array of people that I've been able to work with. I think about the jobs I did with John Buscema, um, who's an, you know, an amazing draftsman, uh, just incredibly talented. Uh, Gil, um, Gene Colan, you know, ha having a chance to, you know, the Howard the Ducks, which were actually decent, you know, they were, they were pretty good work on my part. Uh, Gene, of course, was brilliant. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm pretty fortunate to have, you know, uh, grown up during a certain period of time when those artists were available uh, for me to uh, work with. You know, what surprises me, and I don't know why I'm surprised is, I really don't know why I'm surprised that uh, the kids, uh, you know, in 2021, don't know any of these people. None. If you melt, if you mention Milton Kniff, that no idea. I see those Terry and the Pirates on the back shelf there behind your head. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, my my, at least a token, you know, few copies. But uh, forget about you know Milton Kniff or or you know Bern Hogarth or those guys. Um, they don't know who uh, Gil Kane is. You know, they, they find their artists on Instagram. Um, I don't know, do you guys find your artists on Instagram? <laughs> well, I, I was gonna disagree with your characteriza characterization. And then I realized all the young people I know are old now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like Ed is the kid of the group, you know? It's gonna be 40. <laughs> They're gonna have to get a prostate exam next year. <laughs> Well, and that and that's what happens, Tom. <laughs> that's the way it goes. Yeah. Klaus, did, did you, uh, you know, the legendary John Buscema pages where you turn turn it on the back and there are these beautiful pencil sketches? You ever uh, make make yourself some xeroxes of that those pages whenever? Uh, I, I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. They they you know John was um, you know I don't know if you know the story. You know talk when you talk to John Jr. He 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 met. Uh, spoke to uh, John Buscema uh, much more than I ever did. But uh, he may confirm this, but uh, John, John always said, I don't know if he really believed it, uh, but he always said uh, he'd rather be a butcher and that his, uh, that his uh, uh, ideal or his, his goal was to own a butcher, uh, a shop on Long Island, you know, which is where he lived. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't know if he was just being, you know, sarcastic or ironic, but uh, 
you know, I think we all know John hated uh, drawing buildings and webs on Spider-Man. And, you know, he loved Conan because there were, you know, no straight lines, you know, no grids, no street scenes, you know, no, no, no windows. Right. And I get that. You know, it's it's a lot more fun to just, you know, let the pencil go across the page in a free kind of a, a way. Yeah. Conan's a butcher, you know. Conan's kind of- <laughs> <laughs> a butcher, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Maybe he sublimated a lot of his uh, butcher yeah. uh, stuff uh, through Conan. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Klaus, can we talk about your creator-owned uh, experience, you know, making creator-owned books uh, uh, yeah. briefly here? You had done Sacred Creatures is the first one that comes to mind. How different was that? Um, you know, we talk about personal responsibility. How different is it to do a creator-owned book after decades at Marvel and DC working uh, under an editor? Uh, well, first, th- you know, thanks for mentioning that. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, we're working on the second volume uh, right now, which, which should be out um early spring, maybe late spring. Uh, We're about halfway through the second volume, another eight issues, uh, uh, you know, each each one being like 40 pages. Um, It was a learning experience. Um, Interesting in in that sense. Um, uh, You know, my collaborator is Pablo Romundi and Pablo lives about a half a mile from me. Uh, So, uh, there's a lot of fun in getting together or even talking on the phone about different scenes and you know how do we how do we do this how do we actually create it so there's much more input obviously than say working for marvel or dc um yeah it's a, it's a big responsibility um you know we're only we're only as good as ourselves and our ability to hit deadlines you know we can't blame it on anybody it's it's all just up to the up to the two of us um yeah i i think uh i don't know if that answers your question jim but you know i i will say that you know creator round is really the way to go um and and i'm exploring a couple of options with uh with writers right now um i haven't done any work for marvel or dc in uh, like, I think since March. So it's been about six months, maybe a little longer. Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, there's all that, you know, Substack talk and, 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 and the ability to pretty much uh, get published, you know, almost anywhere these days. So uh, the options are plentiful and uh, more rewarding, I think in not only financially, but also creatively, um, doing a creator own book. Um, it is more rewarding, I have to say. Uh, and working with someone who, um, and some of the, some of the creator own stuff that I'm working on now uh, with different writers, um, it's the same experience. You know, you get an idea from the writer and then, you know, I would say, oh, let's do this, or let's do that, or this guy betrays this guy, you know? And it's a, it's a very much of an organic process as opposed to getting a script and um, illustrating it or drawing it, yeah. I like it. I wonder, like, um, did working on Daredevil um, with Miller, like, were there, did you have, uh, did you contribute ever to the storylines before, you know, like the paper got in front of you? Like, like, did you and Frank ever have sort of like conversations where you're like, oh, I'd really like to see this, this or this happen? Or was there like sort of like a strict, you know, where your storytelling comes in once, once you get, you know, once you get the piece of paper in front of you? I think there were times when I had uh, some contribution to make, Tom, and and uh, depending on where where Frank lived at the time when he was in California, I would make that contribution through Denny, who was the Denny O'Neill, who was the editor. Um, so Denny was the interlocutor between uh, Frank and I at a certain point, um, but nothing, you know, it was really Frank, uh, Frank's story. And uh, you know his layouts, his his sense of storytelling, visual storytelling. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I, you know, I'm thinking that uh, it wasn't until really, um, let's say, the last ten years or so that I felt uh, confident enough to think that I might have something to say in terms of a story. Uh, you know, I've done a couple of short stories. The back in the '80s, I think, the Batman Black and White, um, some backup stories that I that I wrote for DC. Um, but in terms of like these really large overarching plots, um, I haven't really felt confident enough until recently to you know tackle that kind of stuff. And uh, I think also if you're working with Frank, you know he's right. So there's not a lot for me to uh, contribute in terms of story because he knows what he's doing. Um, yeah. Closing question, Klaus. Sure. Uh, appreciate you spending an hour and a half with us uh, here at Cartoonist Kayfabe. Uh, and in that hour and a half, I've been staring over your shoulder and there are some framed pieces of original comic book art on the wall. And I'm just curious what, what that is. Uh, the ones that are uh, up against the wall? Sure. Um, you don't have to grab them or anything like that if you if you don't want to, but I'm just, I'm just curious what, can what you, 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 you deem worthy to be framed up on the wall. Is that better? The, there are three uh, Daredevil pages uh, from left to right. And then there's a Sacred Creatures cover. And then uh, you want me to lift up the uh, laptop? You know what? That drawing board <laughs> looks exquisite, man. Super <laughs> inspiring. I, I love that drawing board. Uh, look at those flat, flat files. Man. Yo, wow. Klaus, we're coming over, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> flat files. We'll be over. Oh, man. All right, can you see that? Okay, we're going to shut up. Um, so there's a uh, three pages from Daredevil, um, from left to right. They're in sequence, uh, which I really like. There's one more page that follows that, which is a bullseye page. Um, and then there's this cover from Sacred Creatures, where I was trying to do a, uh, a Bernie Wrightson riff with, uh, you know, a lot of line work in the background. And then this uh, Batman cover. Uh, from Death and the Maidens. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I have to take the, the Daredevil stuff down because I think the pages are getting yellow from the light. Do, do you guys, uh, I, I can't make it out. Do you recognize yeah, the pages? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, so there's the King, Kingpin. Oh. Yeah. Oh, there's wow. Okay. Yeah. That's Kingpin, uh, of course, as you know. Uh, this is from the story uh, called Guts. Yeah. Uh, which I really liked. Um, we did a, it was a, um, it was a real um, Will Eisner riff. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, we were, uh, I think uh, Frank and I, well, Frank was uh, doing a um, kind of an Eisner storytelling riff. And of course I picked up on that. We're both, you know, big Eisner fans. So uh, that was a lot of fun. And that was the first issue where you kind of took over as like like penciler going from like rough layouts. Do I have that right? I don't know if it was the first one, but it was around that uh, time. Yeah, uh, it was. Yeah. And that that's what I meant by, you know, how Frank was very generous in terms of his uh, uh, trust in 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 myself and, you know, carrying his vision uh, all the way through. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, that was a great, you know, listen, Daredevil was um, awesome. You know, I, I look at the pages sometimes, you know, when I get the reprints and I, and I still think, uh, you know, how the hell did we do this? <laughs> it was great fun. Klaus, that studio looks very conducive to comic book making, man. Yeah. You guys good? Good, yeah. yeah. All right, thanks for your time, man. Uh, is, is there anything uh, to, to promote? You said uh, there's a new Sacred Creatures that's that's forthcoming. When is that coming out? Uh, it should be uh, late spring, 22, uh, or early spring, somewhere around there. But we're really hard at work on it and, uh, you know, want to make it as good as possible. It's actually kind of awesome. Uh, we really uh, move the ball uh, further down the line. And uh, I think it's some of the... Um, some of the best uh, art that I've done. Um, we'll see. Uh, and I'm also, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, starting some new uh, creator-owned stuff. Um, hopefully that'll be out next year too. 
Um, so we'll see. And maybe I get to recolor Dark Knight. <laughs> Please. We're, we're working on yeah. that. <laughs> how, okay. How can Guys, people... listen, let me tell you, I really enjoy uh, your show. I thought, you know, uh, there were, if I might say, the Manhunter episode was fantastic. Oh, cool. You gave Walter all the love that he deserved and Archie. Um, yeah, and some of the, you know, when you guys were reviewing DKR uh, on the original pages, you you know, you really know what you're talking about. And I, I appreciate that. Um, so it's good to be here. That's my point. Well, next time we chat, we need to talk about Duotone because we didn't <laughs> even speak about any of that yet. Uh, but uh, where can people keep updated and appraised of what's going on? Social media links, uh, anything like that? Uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, that's basically it. Um, you know, I don't post as much as I should, obviously. But, uh, you know, uh, once I have more stuff to promote, uh, you know, I keep on thinking I should do, you know, work in progress on Instagram. And uh, I'll try to do that. Yeah. I would appreciate that. Oh, thanks, Jim. I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate the chance to be on Cartoonist KFAB. You have my complete support and love. Thank you very much. Good place to leave it. Yes. I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks guys.